Please note that this is part two. To better understand the story, make sure to watch part one first. I'll have the link down in the description box, but you can also check the playlist. It's going to be right before this video. While they're looking for Courtney inside the house, Mortimer is extremely upset at Courtney for waking him up for the second time. He then decides that he's going to poison her with ant poison would later mention in court that he had bought the ant poison months before because he had an ant problem in his room. He proceeded to get a glass of water and mixed it with poison and gave it to Courtney to drink. However, little Courtney did not like the taste of the water and she immediately spat it out, but unfortunately she had already ingested some of it. Courtney started looking weak and woozy, and it was at this moment that Mortimer heard Marsha calling out her name from the inside, Courtney, Courtney. He immediately started to panic because Courtney was still alive but was somewhat unconscious, so he didn't want her to be discovered in his room in such a state. He later claimed that this is when he decided to insert a towel into her mouth and strangled her until she was no more and then found a blanket and put her body in a corner and covered it with it. Marsha was still calling out for Courtney and she decided to walk towards Mortimer's room and she asked from the outside if Courtney was still watching TV and Mossimo came out with the door slightly open and basically told her that no she left just a few minutes ago she's no longer here. Marsha said okay and went back to the Wendy house to take care of her little baby. In a heartbreaking revelation in court, Mortimer confessed that after this, he uncovered Courtney's body, which he had placed in the corner and proceeded to sexually assault her post-mortem. An hour later, she went into the house once more and asked Adrian if Courtney had come back. Adrian said, no, she's still not back. She then asked the brother to please go to the neighboring houses and looked for Courtney, where she normally played. Marsha went back to her Wendy house once more and Adrian, the little brother, went looking for Courtney in the neighboring houses. It was during this time that Mortimer decided to take the opportunity to go dispose of Courtney's body. He then packed her into a small shopping bag. It was then later revealed in court that he then, after putting her into a shopping bag, he took one of his backpacks and broke some of her bones in order for her to fit in the backpack. Like how evil can one be? He then looked outside to check if no one was around and after he had confirmed that, he put Courtney's body over his shoulder and went out. CCTV footage captures him walking from Elsa's River with Courtney's body over his shoulders all the way to Epping Industrial Area. The first camera captures him at a busy intersection road, passing cars and office building casually as if he's not carrying a deceased baby. He follows this path and turns into an open field. He gets tired next to a train rail and takes a break for a few minutes. And then we see him again walking alongside the railway and he goes into a small plot and he found a tree there where he removed her from the backpack and places her under this tree. He then tries to look for stuff to cover her with. He finds a couple of newspapers and then he quickly leaves her at this area and you can see him walking away and makes his way back to Elsa's River. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, Mortimo arrives back to the house and with him, he has a printed CV for Marsha. Marsha had asked him a few weeks ago to please type and print a CV for her because she wanted to start applying for jobs. Mortimo knocked at Marsha's room and basically says to her, no, I just got back from the library. I had some work to do. And I also actually got the time to finally do that CV you asked me to do for you. And then he hands it over to her. And she was actually pretty happy about it and thanked him.
Just before he turns around to leave, he asks, ah, did Courtney finally come back? And she actually says, no, they're still looking for her. And he mentioned that, you know what, when I was walking to the library, I actually looked around as well, and I didn't see her anywhere. And then he also said that, you know, in the morning when she came to our room, I did see her speaking to the man who stays opposite our house. He said this as he was walking towards his room and left Marsha. Masha was left panicking at this point and she was really, really getting worried. And she thought, okay, maybe she should also start looking and leave the house. 4 p.m., Yonette returned from work and the six-year-old quickly rushed to her and said, Courtney is lost, mom. We haven't seen Courtney the whole day. She's lost, she's missing, she's lost. And Yonette immediately dropped all her bags and she started looking aggressively for her daughter. At around 7 p.m. in the evening, they had still not found Courtney. At this point, they decided to call their local police station and report her missing. However, the police didn't immediately take the case seriously. While on the other hand, the community was out on the ground and they were all aggressively looking for Courtney throughout the night. Everyone in Alsace River started looking for Courtney. The news of the missing baby quickly caught momentum on social media as well as general media. Missing persons posters were put out and the hashtag find Courtney started trending. And the next day, Courtney's mother went on national television and begged for her daughter's return. Everyone looked for Courtney. This is including Mortimo. Mortimo was one of the main people who were literally trying to find Courtney when he knew exactly where he put her. Also, we had the police minister at the time, Figil Mbalula, who went to visit the family and they pledged that they would help with all the resources that they had to try and find Courtney. Days went by and the community did not stop searching. They were searching day in and day out. And on the 10th day, a woman who was part of the search team thought she saw something and proceeded to walk towards it. And unfortunately, under a tree and a small plot in an industrial park in Epping, she found the body of Courtney Pietis. It was immediately positively identified as Courtney because they knew exactly what she was wearing. She had a pair of shorts on which had embroidery. And when they noticed, it was actually not closed. The zipper was opened. And an autopsy later confirmed that indeed Courtney was violated. The police started to look for evidence and they caught their first break when they realized that there was actually CCTV surveillance cameras in the area which Courtney was found, meaning whoever had put her there would have been caught on camera. They got the footage and looked at it and decided to release it out to everyone in the community because someone might recognize him. And lo and behold, one man did. A man named Gail Barron, who was Mortimer's childhood friend, also stayed in the area, said that he 100% was sure that that was Mortimer. He told the police that he grew up with this guy and he could spot his walk from a distance. Plus, he was wearing the kinds of clothes that Mortimo had. The police then decided that they would bring canine dogs to the Peter's house. And the moment the dogs got into the yard, they immediately ran towards Mortimo's room. The police decided that there was enough probable cause and decided to call Mortimo in for questioning. After a lengthy interrogation, Mortimer decided to confess, but continually explained that 
Actually, he raped her after killing her, as if that was okay. Perhaps to him, maybe he thought you lose the rights to your body. Postmortem, I do not get it. But he literally continuously explained throughout his confession that he did not rape her when she was still alive. As if that makes a difference. I don't get it. So later on in court proceedings, when he realized that, you know what, it weighs the same that he raped her post-mortem, he decided to change his story and say that, no, he did not rape her with his genitals, but rather he used his fingers only. But of course, the post-mortem had found some fluids, so that was also a lie. South Africans were outraged because of this case because of how gruesome it is and who it was particularly done to. The then president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, also visited the family after the fact and promised the mother that he would get her a house, considering that this maybe would not have happened if they were staying in their own place without tenants. Baby Courtney was laid to rest in a heartbreaking funeral that was broadcasted on national television. The case went to court and Mortimer was given two life sentences. The judge also noted that she would be giving the mother a pardon for negligence and child abandonment and would not be taking away her six-year-old child, because of this. Because she said that at least she was not just leaving them and going somewhere else, she was going to try to earn a living. And she has already gone through so much. And on that heartbreaking note, we have come to the end of the video. Please remember to check out the rest of the true crime playlist. And I'll be seeing you guys very soon. Bye.